Hello, I'm Brian Atkinson and welcome once again to UK Aircraft Explored. In this video, we shall cover the navigator's position within the Avro Lancaster bomber. We'll also look at some of the navigation equipment used, including the Astrograph and G Mark II. As always, we shall be referring to various wartime Air Ministry manuals. I hope you find this interesting. The navigator's position is located just forward of the wireless operator's position, on the port side of the aircraft. The navigator's seat is supported on a pivoted arm of welded tubes, mounted on the aft leg of the table. It can also revolve on its attachment to the arm. The pivoted arm can be locked in any position by means of a hand screw which tightens the upper collar. When not in use, the seat is turned under the table. Its movement is limited by a check cable attached to the floor by a quick release catch to facilitate access to the radio power units. The navigator's table is attached to form as A, 1, 2, 3 and 4 on the port side, the inner edge being supported on two tubular stays. The top is of plywood with an upper surface of langite and is strengthened by two wooden stiffeners and two radio crate bearer rails. A large drawer with a let down front is fitted into the side of the table. The aft end of the table, which carries radio equipment, is supported from the top of Former 3 by tubular members. At this end of the table is a hinged flap which can be folded to gain access to a second drawer in the end. Below the table, a crate is provided for the accumulators supported in runners. A blackout curtain is provided for fixing at the forward end of the table in order to prevent glare into the cockpit. It is attached to the edge of the table and to form a one by lift the dot fasteners and when not in use, is rolled up and stowed in the tube below the forward edge of the table. We shall now look at the equipment used by Lancaster navigators as follows. We'll start with a look at the DF or direction finding loop. As we've seen in other videos, the DF loop is mounted just forward of the astrodome. Fitted beneath the DF loop, in the roof above the navigator's position, is the direction finding bearing hub. It is used to physically rotate the DF loop fitted immediately above the drum beneath the canopy. It was used by the navigator or wireless operator to home into an allied airfield transmitting signal. Once the loop had been turned to the correct position to give the wireless operator a strong signal, the approximate bearing could be read off the drum. The pilot, navigator and wireless operator each had DF Visual Indicator Mark 1s fitted onto their instrument panels, which gave them a visual means of keeping the aircraft on track to the homing radio signal. When the aircraft systems were first switched on, the gyro compass would not be able to read where the aircraft was. Therefore, a series of pulses will be fed in from the Compass Variation Setting Correction Unit, Mark 1. To ensure the DR, that's the distant reading, compass repeaters read correctly. Part of the DR compass system, this unit was fitted to all Lancasters. The Master Distance Reading Compass, Mark 1, is mounted on the starboard side of the fuselage, just forward of the main entrance door. The variation setting corrector is located in the fuselage roof at the navigator's station, between formers 2 and 3. The navigator's DR repeater is mounted on the navigator's instrument panel. The pilot's repeater is mounted above his instrument panel, and the control panel is located at the bottom left-hand side of the pilot's instrument panel. 
The navigator's drift recorder Mark II is located behind the navigator's seat on the starboard wall of the aircraft. Its function was to record the aircraft's drift in flight, measuring the difference between the aircraft's track and heading. The navigator would look through the eyepiece on the recorder and the periscope would enable him to view the ground directly below the aircraft. The recorder would be used to gain a visual indication of the aircraft's drift from course. Here's a view of the drift periscope from outside the aircraft. Here is a view of the Mark 9 bubble sectant stowage case, which is a velvet lined anti shock box. Located behind the pilot's seat on the side of the navigator's table, along with a portable Gravener fire extinguisher and an Irwin parachute tray. The sextant is used by the navigator to take star readings, whilst the sextant is suspended from the astrodome, as shown here. The manual astrocompass is a device that is pointed to a known star, that also includes the sun, and then it will indicate true north. A typical version is the Astra Compass Mark II, as shown here. The Lancaster normally carried two compasses, as well as an Astra Compass, one being the magnetic compass P4, 6 or 10, whilst the other was the DR, that's a distance reading, compass. With bombing operations lasting several hours, it was necessary to check the compasses and if any doubt existed due to differences between them, it was possible to check the bearing or course with the Astra Compass, providing either the sun, moon or night sky was visible. By using a nautical almanac, the position of an object in the sky could be determined, and when sighted on with the Astra Compass, readings taken from the scales would enable the navigator to determine the true course of the aircraft. The Astro Compass was generally replaced by more reliable bubble sextants as the war continued. We will now look at the air and ground position indicators, along with the air mileage unit. They were useful navigation aids enabling the navigator to work out the mileage the aircraft had covered. He would set the variation setting corrector via the two dials on the right of the instruments, the bearing north, south and the east and west. The true course compass on the left would work directly with the DR compass and would give the navigator a true course bearing. This information would then be electrically passed into the ground position indicator Mark 1B above the navigator's table. The air position indicator received its mileage input from the air mileage unit Mark 2 which in turn measured the air mileage from the Lancaster's pitot tube. The air mileage unit then converted this information to the number of revolutions of a flexible shaft that ran from the air mileage unit beneath the navigator's table up to the air position indicator, rather like the speedometer cable on a car. The revolutions of the shaft would match the speed of the aircraft and the air position indicator would, with the addition of the navigator's setting of the variation setting corrector, work out the true air position the aircraft was at, given in the form of a bearing. The ground position indicator Mark I, shown here, was an ingenious and heavy piece of equipment, which could be considered an early attempt to create a navigation instrument that offered a similarity to modern satellite positioning equipment. The system was packed with complex repeater motors and mirrors and would project an arrow image onto a map on the navigator's table. The arrow would move over the map in the direction of the aircraft's flight and would provide an accurate means for the navigator to obtain his aircraft position. The air mileage indicator Mark I is an extension to the air mileage unit and is designed to provide a continuous indication of air distance flown. 
Though primarily intended for the flight engineer, this information was also of use to the navigator. Since the instrument is controlled directly by the air mileage unit and does not depend in any way on the air position indicator, it may in particular assist in the keeping of a manual air plot when the API is either faulty or not carried in the aircraft. Some Lancasters were fitted with the Astrograph Mark 1A and B. This instrument was fitted over the navigator's plotting table. It was designed to provide a rapid and accurate reduction of sextant observations of the altitude of selected fixed stars. It enabled a position to be fixed during flight without calculations, reference tables or astronomical knowledge. The astrograph used lamps and rolls of film to project down onto the plotting chart a series of equal altitude curves for each of a pair of selected stars, together with a mean time scale, any value of which is termed astrograph mean time. Each projected curve, when correctly positioned for the date and time of observation, indicates on the chart all the points at which the star has a given altitude. A position line corresponding to an observed altitude of one of the two stars can then be drawn on the chart. A similar line crossing the first can then be drawn for the observed altitude of the second star, and thus the position can be fixed. The astrograph was designed for use with the standard plotting series charts on a scale of 1 to 1 million at latitude 56 degrees. The G-Navigation system was developed and tested in August 1941 and first used operationally on the night of the 8th and 9th of March 1942 during a raid on the German industrial city of Essen. G was not a radar system, but a means of transmitting pulse radio signals in the form of a grid out over enemy territory from three ground transmitter chain stations located in England. The A master station and the two B and C slave stations were usually placed around 100 miles apart. The system worked by measuring the difference in time between the Master A radio pulse and the B slave pulse. The second part of the pulse cycle would involve another A pulse called A2 and the C slave pulse. Once this information was known, the time would be converted by the navigator's G indicator unit and the information translated to match the special G map of the area. The map was printed with an overlay of matching hyperbolic lattice grid lines and numbers. From this, the navigator could work out his aircraft's position in relation to the grid lines. G had a range of around 400 miles and would enable an accurate position fix to be obtained to less than 6 miles in any weather condition. The term G was derived from the word grid. We shall now look at other equipment the navigator would use. The navigator's table was fitted with a Terry Type L315 angle poise lamp, designed to be positioned wherever he required light over his map table. This example is fitted with a red filter to reduce excessive light from the cockpit area at night. It should be noted that Lancaster navigators often had their compartment curtained off during flight. Here's a view showing a selection of standard navigator's instruments. They would often be kept in a hinged table shelf during flight. They are as follows. The oxygen and intercommunication mask, the flying helmet, a parallel rule, compasses and spare leg container, the course and speed calculator Mark 2A, the height and airspeed computer Mark 2A, and an astrograph Mark 1A spanner. The navigator also used the navigational computer Mark 3, commonly known as the Dalton. It was an instrument designed for solving mechanically 
the vector triangle problem of air navigation. A height and speed computer is included, calibrated according to either isothermal or ICANN laws. Here's another navigational instrument. It was called the Douglas. Here is a view of the storage box for the Douglas, which was a combined protractor and parallel roll. Here is a view of an original Bomber Command target map of a German town dated November 1943. The Royal Air Force would constantly send out photo reconnaissance Spitfire and Mosquito aircraft to take aerial photographs of target areas, towns and villages in order to keep navigation maps up to date. As you can see the maps were limited in detail, only providing features visible from the height Allied bomber aircraft would fly. Also included on the map are range scales needed for target identification, bombing and navigation. Well that's it for this video. I'll be covering H2S radar in a later video. If you like what I do on this channel, please click the like button and please subscribe. And also click the bell. Remember it's free and you'll receive notifications when my future videos are posted. Thanks as always for watching and I'll see you again next time. Bye for now.